Good afternoon, and welcome to another LCV Climate Insider Briefing. The program will begin shortly. This webinar will be recorded. Good afternoon. I'm Tiernan Sittenfeld, Senior Vice President of Government Affairs at the League of Conservation Voters. Thank you all for joining us today, and thank you for your support and your interest in our work. We are so pleased to be joined by hundreds of attendees from across the country, including members of the LCV Board of Directors, LCV members, and allies across the movement. Today, we are thrilled to discuss the Biden-Harris administration's ambitious conservation goals to protect 30% of our land, water, and oceans by 2030, and the locally-led efforts that will help us reach and surpass these goals. In fact, today we are releasing a brand new report through the Conservation Voters Movement that is detailing the conservation progress at the state and the local level. And you can view it at lcv.org backslash 30 by 30 report. The by is an X. Um, so we are absolutely delighted to be joined by chair of the White House Council on Environmental Quality, Brenda Mallory. She is such a champion for climate and justice and natural resource priorities. After our conversation, Alex Terrell, LCV's conservation program director, will lead a panel discussion with Colorado State Representative Leslie Harrod, Florida State Representative Ben Diamond, and Boise, Idaho Mayor Lauren McLean. This will be about the latest updates from city halls to state legislatures and beyond, as well as their ideas of where we go from here. LCB is proud to support the 30 by 30 initiative and to work with our more than 30 state LCB partners and other organizations, elected officials, community leaders, and the public to protect our lands and waters and expand access to the outdoors. The varied approaches to conservation in different communities helps to emphasize the incredible and growing support for protecting 30% of our natural world by 2030. And now I'm so honored to introduce the chair of the White House Council on Environmental Quality, Brenda Mallory. As chair, she advises the president on environmental and natural resource policies that improve, preserve, and protect public health and the environment for America's communities. She is especially focused on addressing the environmental justice and climate change challenges our nation faces, and she's playing a leading role in guiding the Biden-Harris administration's commitment to direct 40% of climate and clean energy investment benefits to communities of color and low wealth communities who are harmed the most by the legacy of toxic pollution. This is also known as the Justice 40 Initiative. On conservation, she worked closely with Secretaries Holland at the Department of Interior, Vilsack at the Department of Agriculture, and Raimondo at the Department of Commerce, to, and many others to develop initial recommendations on how to advance an inclusive and collaborative vision to reach 30 by 30 goals. The Biden-Harris administration has already moved to end old growth logging and barring road development in the Tongass National Forest in Alaska, and to, spend, to suspend oil leases in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. Uh, these are um, especially exciting to me, as are issues that I've worked on throughout my entire career. And of course, she's been very involved in undertaking a review of the broken federal oil and gas program. Of course, there is so much more that we're eager for this administration to do, starting with restoring protections for the national monuments that the former president attacked, like Bears Ears, Grand Staircase Escalante, and the Northeast Canyons and Seamounts. But for right now, we are so excited to have this conversation. Chair Mallory, thank you for your incredible leadership. Thank you for being with us today. And I love it if you could just kick us off by talking a little bit more in depth about the administration's America the Beautiful Initiative and 30 by 30. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Tiernan. And it's just a thrill to be here and have a chance to talk to both you and your members. Um, before I get started, though, I do want to say what a great report you've done. Um, it was really a thrill to have a chance to, to take a look at that and, you know, to just see uh, some of the initiatives that are going on across uh, the country at the you know, state and local level, which are hugely important for the work that we're planning on doing uh, in, in partnership under the America the Beautiful initiative. Um, I just passed my 100th day as the chair uh, of CEQ, <laughs> and we also just uh, passed six months uh, since President Biden uh, took office. Um, and for those of you who are sort of generally paying attention, you know that yesterday was a big milestone for us as well as we uh, see progress made on the effort to come up with a, a bipartisan agreement uh, that will 
uh, have historic investments across the board in areas that are important for clean energy, uh, among other things. So um, it's a lot going on here. I'm tremendously honored to work in an administration that is prioritizing climate action, environmental protection, and environmental justice. Conserving and restoring the lands and waters that support and sustain us is an important aspect to addressing climate change, the loss of nature, and environmental injustice. So in May, President Biden announced the America the Beautiful Initiative. Uh, it's a locally led, nationally scaled effort to conserve and restore at least 30% of our nation's lands uh, and waters by 2030. President Biden's decision to set a national conservation goal for the next decade is historic. Never before has a president outlined a vision of this kind, and certainly not this early in the administration. And importantly, equity and access are at the center of this initiative. Uh, we know that too often our lands and waters have been places of inequitable access and injustice. So with this initiative, our charge is to think broadly and inclusively about how to achieve conservation goals in a way that improves the quality of all Americans' lives now and for decades to come. And lucky for us, uh, we have amazing examples at the state and local level to help guide the work that we're doing. For that, I wanna sincerely thank all of you for your advocacy efforts. One thing that we know is that this initiative will only be successful if we actively engage local, state, and tribal governments, community members, and a range of stakeholders. The number of state-level conservation goals being enacted and cities stepping up to ensure that all members of their community have safe and equitable access to nature is really inspiring. Your partnership is invaluable and will continue to be as we move forward. My ask of you is to stay engaged. Continue to push solutions in, our, in your community. Continue to offer feedback and guidance as we implement the president's vision. When people see what these national efforts look like in local communities and the differences they make in people's lives, that will make the changes durable. So thank you for the work that you do and I'm happy to answer some questions. Excellent. Thank you so much for your powerful words and your leadership and LCB. We could not agree about more about the importance of people staying involved, using the power of their voices that has such an impact and is so important. And uh, thank you for referencing. Yes, there are so many things happening in DC right now. You mentioned the bipartisan infrastructure framework deal that was arrived at yesterday. And of course, that makes necessary investments. Uh, we are also extremely focused on the transformational change that we need through the, recon the budget reconciliation process and believe that that is really our shot at once in a generation progress on climate, on environmental justice, on clean energy, on good paying union jobs. Um, so of course we are so grateful for all of the executive action and leadership and really excited to see that paired with legislation. So um, thank you for referencing that. And we're actually excited to take a couple of questions from our audience. And first I'm gonna turn it over to Tanisha Harris from Illinois. Welcome, Tanisha. Thank you for allowing me to speak today. My name is Tanisha Harris, and I am from South Shore in Chicago, Illinois. I am the Chicagoland Conservation Manager at the Illinois Environmental Council. I'm pleased this special report includes House Bill 3928, which created the Illinois 30 by 30 Conservation Task Force to host listening sessions throughout the state to identify ways in which the campaign can be adopted. Illinois has one of the largest Black, Indigenous, People of Color communities, 309 state parts, and a sprawling rural and suburban areas, along with the city of Chicago. As we strive to become the conservation leader we once were, how does 30 by 30 help us reach urban and rural communities with sometimes very different conservation priorities and opportunities? Excellent. Well, so thank you so much for that, Tanisha. And I would say that one of the things that we've learned already by the engagement of um, equity communities all across the country is that there is a lot for us to learn about what the special interests and needs are. And I think that through an engagement in the American, the beautiful um, um, program, uh, continuing to reach out and see what local governments are doing, reach out to advocacy organizations, reach out to local community groups, 
uh, and find out what makes the most sense from, uh, from the perspective of those communities in terms of what conservation looks like. I mean, one of the reasons that we um, did not in finalizing the plan identify like specific areas uh, or specific things that we thought were necessary as the projects in any one place was a recognition that across the country, there are different um, factors, different um, circumstances that drive what is of value to a community and will be impactful to that community and therefore be more enduring in that community. And so we came up with general principles that sort of put in place uh, the ideas that we're looking for. And it's through a engagement process going forward that I think we were expecting to come up with uh, together. Um, what are the, the specific examples of things that will work? And I know just from the, uh, both, as I said, the equity groups that I've talked to, and in particular, some of those that have been sort of specializing in parks in particular and trying to um, change the, the fact that in you know, brown and black communities in general, there is less green. And we know the important value that green space has to the health of people and to just the you know, mental uh, benefits to it. Um, and so just trying to address those kinds of issues, but do it in a way that is going to be successful in those communities, I think is gonna be very important. Thank you so much for that, Chair Mallory, and absolutely couldn't agree more. And the way that you all are doing this and focus so much on justice and equity and inclusivity, of course, could not be more important. And Tanisha, thank you so much to you and congratulations on your successes and um, kudos to the students and please keep up the great leadership. Um, and now we're gonna take our next question from Christy Cabrera from Nevada. Christy. Hi, thank you so much for having me. My name is Christy Cabrera and I'm the Policy and Advocacy Director for the Nevada Conservation League. I was proud to work with our champions in the legislature to pass the first ever state resolution in support of 30 by 30. Nevadans are working hard to preserve our special places, including Evicuame, a new potential monument in Southern Nevada. How do you and the Biden administration plan to engage with communities, in particular tribal communities, working to strengthen protections for new places? Yeah, so thank you so much for that. And I think in, in a similar to what I was saying to Tanisha, I mean, I think that the whole effort that we are building is gonna be based on engagement, engagement all across the country with different communities so that we are sure that what we are producing and what we are ad, ad, you know, advocating for and advancing reflects the um, priorities of the communities, reflects the values of the communities. Uh, as we work towards this common goal. I think we know um, when you talk to people on the ground that we have a shared sense across this country of wanting to uh, ensure that we have kind of livable environments, healthy and productive livable environments. And that when we are given uh, the opportunity within our own communities to focus on that, Sometimes it allows for some of the issues that are, um, you know, that keep us divided on a national level. It allows us to work through those. It allows us to, to, to organize around the conservation uh, efforts in our own community that everyone cares about. And so I think that's a very important um, pillar of what this uh, America, uh, the beautiful initiative is, is trying to accomplish. Great, thank you for that, Chair Mallory, and thank you, Christy. And now I'd actually love to ask about our oceans. So of course, I don't need to tell you this, but our oceans are of course an incredible resource as we work to mitigate the climate crisis. And several years ago, we were really pleased when President Obama and then Vice President Biden established the Northeast Canyons and Seamounts Marine National Monument, the first marine monument in the Atlantic. Can you talk a little bit about some of the administration's priorities when it comes to ocean and marine conservation? Yeah, I, and, and that's an area where CEQ is definitely gonna be uh, actively engaged. In fact, we've been talking to partners at uh, OSTP and other folks here in the White House about sort of re-energizing our ocean policy uh, committee, which is in existence. And I think will be a really important mechanism for us to think about um, both where the opportunities are, but like you know, where the um, priorities should be in terms of how we focus our attention. Um, America the Beautiful was definitely intended to embrace land and water. Uh, I think there apparently was some confusion about that uh, early on, but there's, there should be no confusion. 
oceans and waters in general are reflected in um, in our vision of the plan. And you know, thinking about the work that NOAA does and its focus on um, uh, sanctuaries and other forms of protected areas, I think is going to be one tool. But there are, are surely other tools that will be uh, emphasized as we as we start our engagement with with the communities about particular ocean areas or um, or water areas within those communities that you know need um, uh, you know attention or uh, specific uh, ways to address that would be powerful in this effort that we're that we're trying to uh, put forward. So. Uh, exactly what it is again as i've said like we're we're not trying to prejudge um we just see that there are many tools that the federal government has and and other tools that states and local governments have and we're going to tap into all of those great i think this collaborative inclusive approach is so important and i also really appreciate it a few minutes ago um your praise of our report that we're releasing today we know very high standard so that means a lot <laughs> And that does highlight examples of state and local conservation, as well as expressions of support for 30 by 30. And one of those expressions is a statement from tribal organizations representing over 50 federal, federally recognized tribes who called, and I'm going to quote, um, vitally important opportunity to safeguard the environment and tribal cultural values, strengthen the nation to nation relationship, and uphold tribal sovereignty, self determination. And of course, we know that the Biden-Harris administration has prioritized restoring relationships and trust with Native Americans and indigenous communities, including co-management of some lands and resources. So can you talk a little bit more about how 30 by 30 helps us work collabor collaboratively with and learn from tribal leaders? And how can this initiative work toward fulfilling commitments made, um, but not usually kept, obviously, very unfortunately throughout our history? Yeah, no, the uh, great question. And I think one of the things that, you know, uh, that we tried to um, make clear as we established the America the Beautiful framework was just that one of the things that we know that we have less data on, less understanding on really has to do with the conservation that's already occurring on tribal lands. Like we have databases that exist that have tracked other uh, conservation uh, values in, in you know, different areas uh, of the country, but we don't have anything that sort of has included the, what's happened on tribal lands in the same way. And so I think we know that that's an area where there are things happening that there may be less uh, understanding or less visibility about. We also know that there is, um, you know, there's traditional ecological knowledge that tri tribes bring to um, the, uh, the, you know, the preservation, conservation of lands. And that's something that also has not necessarily been always valued in the same way. And so I think we really think that that's important as we think about how we um, I not only identify what the conservation uh, activities are, but also how we measure what is, uh, is conservation. So I, I think that those are elements of the, the plan that are gonna be very important. Definitely. Um, so our new report also highlights some of the different ways that communities and states have been stepping up to protect the places that they know best from Connecticut's investments in restoring the Long Island Sound to California's executive order setting a 30 by 30 goal for the state's land and ocean areas to Michigan investing $400 million in state and local parks. And um, I think this is a great, um, maybe even our last question um, before we turn it back to you for any parting thoughts, but before we go to the panel to hear from state and local leaders, but can you talk a little bit more about how you view these state and local actions being connected to the administration's efforts to reach 30 by 30? Yeah, I think, I, again, I'll say it again. I think that, you know, we often talk about what happens at the state and local level as being kind of the incubator for the best ideas that make it to the, the, the federal level. And, and I do think that there is truth in that. Um, and in the case of conservation and, um, and other forms of protection, you know, what those actions symbolize is something that's of importance and in value in a particular community. Like they have already, they have already shown an interest on their own. And so that the idea that we, through the federal um, tools, could leverage and help advance what have, have already been identified is going to be a much more successful effort than, you know, having a sort of Washington-based look down on like what we think is the best uh, step to take. And so you already have a community of people who are 
focused on the issue, who have already invested in sort of uh, making sure that within their own community that there is some sense of consensus around it. And I think that's going to be really important to us again, you know, with the notion that we want enduring conservation. We want uh, we want things that um, will not only uh, you know last for the time that we're that you know whatever that we're in office, but much further than that. And to use those good ideas, because sometimes you know, from from this vantage point, you may not even appreciate some of the tools that are being lifted up. And like you can use that as a best practice to share with other um, with other cities and other states as as a way to. Um, get that idea instilled in other places. So um, there's an interconnection that I think is hugely important. Absolutely. Uh, well, Chair Mallory, this is such a treat to get to have this conversation yes. you know, this earlier, but I got my start um, doing environmental work because I was lucky enough to go out West having grown up in Ohio um, when I was in high school and just fell in love with, with the Western part of this country and really instilled in me such a desire to wanna protect um, these special iconic places and to ensure that everyone would be able to experience them and enjoy them. And so again, I'm just so grateful to you for your tireless leadership. Um, before I close us out and turn to the next part of our discussion, I'd love to know if there's any parting thoughts or any advice. Again, we have such a great group of people uh, watching along today and I know we're all so eager to ensure that this administration and that you as the chair of CEQ are absolutely maximizing success in every every possible way. So any any final thoughts for people? Yeah, I will just say two things. Uh, one, just in response to your reference to the West, I mean, because I think a lot of times when we talk about um, preservation and conservation, a lot of us go to the West because there's such great examples of things, but there's just, there are, there are great areas all across this country. Uh, and having spent a little time um, uh, with uh, Southeast issues recently. I know that that's an area of the country that has tremendous, uh, there's tremendously valuable resources there and also an ethic around it. So that's what we're searching out for is like in each of the regions of the country, what those, um, you know, what that interest is and how to sort of tap into that. And then secondly, I would just say to all of your members, like, please stay engaged. I mean, if you, if the message that this is a, a program that we're hoping to use as a means of engagement all across the country did not come through. Let me just say it again. <laughs> uh, uh, we are, there will be many opportunities as we move forward uh, to get your feedback, to get your thoughts on ideas, to hear your suggestions about what are areas that, you know, are, are deserving of uh, conservation and maybe they're not getting enough attention or, you know, what, what's the kind of missed gem that no one, or hidden gem that no one knows about, but le needs some help uh, in making sure that it um, maintains its uh, value within the community. Like all of that is going to be really important. So thank you for your participation so far and thank you for whatever you're uh, willing to do going forward. Well, we are definitely um, not shy. We as an organization and as activists and as people participating in this conversation, watching along um, online today, these are issues that matter so personally to all of us. And we are all in to help you maximize your conservation progress, not just for the West. I've actually lived on the East Coast for yes. years <laughs> now, so I couldn't agree more. There are absolutely <laughs> places all across this country. Um, we definitely you know, can't stress enough how much we want um, to ensure that you all are able to maximize progress. We especially are eager to see President Biden move ahead with his commitment to restore protections for Bears Ears, Grand Staircase Escalante, and again on the East Coast, the Northeast Canyons and Seamounts. Um, so thank you, thank you, thank you for your tireless leadership, for being with us today, and for your, um, for your advice for people to stay engaged and involved and to um, to, to make sure that CEQ hears from you. Um, and we will, I promise you, we will keep doing that. So thank you. Thank you, Tiernan. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Um, and now um, for those of you following along, please don't go anywhere. We're really excited to turn to the second part of our program, which is a panel discussion on how this conservation work is progressing at the state and local level, which of course, Chair Mallory and I have just been discussing. This part of the conversation will be led by my fantastic colleague, Alex Terrell, who is our conservation program director. I've had the chance to work closely with Alex for more than a decade, and he has led um, incredible highlights over many years. For example, just last year, leading LCV's 
work to get the Great American Outdoors Act, which is the biggest um, conservation win in quite, quite a long time, get that enacted into law, even during the former administration, no less. And he's going to be joined by a trio of conservation champions, state reps Leslie Harrod and Ben Diamond, and then Mayor Lauren McLean. So Alex, thank you for all that you do, and I'm so happy to turn it over to you. Uh, thanks so much, Tiernan. I uh, really appreciate those incredibly kind words. Um, I want to thank Chair Mallory uh, um, for her participation and her um, incredible comments. Um, and thanks to all of you for tuning in today. Um, you know, it's incredibly exciting to have an administration here who's committed to these big and bold goals on nature conservation. It's one of the reasons why who we elect, it just it matters so, so much. So. Um, the, the 30 by 30 initiative, it's not something that the Biden administration just kind of dreamt up out of nowhere. Um, you know, scientists a number of years ago said we need to keep that much nature to fight the climate crisis, to save wildlife from going extinct, and to make access to nature more equitable. And so LCV was really proud to take that science and be one of the first groups that was advocate, advocating it for it here in the United States. Um, we got to work a few years ago working with our network of, uh, of state LCVs to help spread the word about 30 by 30. And we found a really receptive audience because people love their parks, they love their public lands. And so we helped organize letters um, from hundreds of elected officials in, in states and communities all across America saying that they support the goals of 30 by 30. Um, and the Biden-Harris administration, they responded to that widespread support all across the country. And they declared this our first ever national conservation goal. So it's an incredibly exciting um, time for those of us who, 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 who love our parks and public lands and know that so many of you that are tuning in today. Um, 30 by 30, it's an ambitious goal, but it's incredibly achievable. And it's going to take a combination of action from the federal government, but also certainly action at the state and local level among tribal nations, private landowners, we've all got a role to play in, uh, in boosting access to nature. And the great news that we're, that we're uh, communicating here today with our report is that states and communities um, all across the country are stepping up to protect the places that they know best, invest in the next generation of conservation, and then take some really innovative approaches that center equity. Um, and so our report really compiles that progress, and I'm incredibly excited that we've got um, three uh, really great up-and-coming elected officials on this panel who are leading on conservation in their communities and whose efforts we're highlighting in our new report. So we're going to hear some opening remarks from them, and then we'll get to some Q&A after that. So first, uh, we are going to hear from Colorado State Representative um, Leslie Harrod. She represents the Northeast section of Denver, elected in 2016 as the first LGBTQ African American in the General Assembly. She chairs the Colorado Black Democratic Legislative Caucus. I am incredibly excited to have her here, and we're going to hear about her leadership on the creation of the new Colorado Outdoor Equity Grant Program. Um, next, we'll hear from uh, Lauren McLean. She is the first woman elected mayor of Boise, Idaho. Uh, before public service, she led the historic Boise Foothills open space levy campaign and secured protection for the Boise Foothills. Um, she served on the Boise City Council. She led efforts to pass Boise's 100% clean energy plan. Now as the mayor, she's leaning into the fight against climate change. And I'm incredibly excited to hear about the unique conservation goals uh, that the city of Boise is spearheading, spearheading under her leadership. Um, and then finally, Florida uh, Representative Ben Diamond, he represents the area around St. Petersburg. Uh, before becoming an elected official, Ben was part of the legal team uh, that led a successful campaign to amend Florida's constitution to provide dedicated funding uh, for land and water conservation. He's now a state representative and he's been a leader on efforts to prepare Florida for the impacts of climate change I'm definitely excited to hear about his longtime advocacy uh, for fully funding Florida Forever, uh, that state's premier conservation and land acquisition program and a real um, priority of our Florida Conservation Voters State League down there. Um, so excited to hear from our panelists. Um, I'm going to turn it over to, to Representative Harrod for some opening comments. Oh, well, thank you so much uh, for the introduction and thanks so much for having me. Hey everyone, State Representative Leslie Harrod from Denver, Colorado. Uh, I am proud to be here and to be able to champion our outdoor equity grant program that we created within the state of Colorado. As some of you all may know or have heard, Colorado is experiencing massive population growth. And with that growth, we're seeing a lot of demographic shifts. Um, and that includes an increase in African-American, LGBT, and other BIPOC populations. 
Um, but we're also increasingly becoming a home for outdoor recreational enthusiasts uh, from across the nation, driving our state uh, more than $62 billion outdoor recreational industry. So with this boon in outdoor recreation participation, the data shows us though that not all participations are sharing in the full benefits of Colorado's great outdoors. And as one of the most beautiful states, if not the most beautiful state in the nation, it's a real shame um, that we're not all participating uh, at the same levels. So of course we know that the color of one's skin or the amount of one's bank account shouldn't predict safe and ready access to the outdoors. There continues to be um, diminished opportunities for outdoor recreation for children in underserved communities uh, and low income communities to access our historic lands. Um, and quite frankly, the historic and systemic barriers to equitable um, access to the outdoors uh, is a huge problem. In fact, I came at this work because a group of my friends who created Colorado's um, chapter of the Outdoor Afro um, went out and hiked in one of our beautiful um, hiking areas right outside of Denver and were basically um, told to leave the trail because folks had not experienced Black women um, hiking. It didn't feel like it was a space for such a large crowd of Black people. Um, of course, that led to a lot of education to the community um, and to the folks who were in the area, but it also reminded us that we got to be out there more. Um, in fact, studies show that when we spend time in the outdoors, we actually, and our young people, receive um, huge benefits, including health benefits, um, mental, mental health benefits, reduced stress, um, and enhanced social skills. So it's extremely important that everyone is able to access the outdoors in, in, in an equitable way. So what do we do in Colorado? Well, we already have a huge amount of money that is set aside for the outdoor industry right here in Colorado through our lottery um, dollars. But more people are playing the lottery and the money has increased. So we've been able to take the increased funding that has come in through the lottery revenues to create an outdoor equity fund that will support groups like Outdoor Afro and so many other organizations that are getting BIPOC folks, LGBTQ people, low-income folks, children, veterans, people with disabilities into the outdoors and reducing those economic and uh, those systemic barriers that keep us out of, of those spaces. So I'm so excited to be able to say that our fund will produce $5 million per year to get folks outside. And the board that oversees those funds are directly represented by impacted communities. And that's required in the bill. So this is a great Colorado initiative. You know, I mean, we have beautiful peaks, sand dunes, valleys. I mean, we are a beautiful state and everyone should enjoy them. But I have a secret mission, and that is to make sure that Colorado is supporting the next generation of diverse conservationists. And that's what we're really doing with this fund. So I'm excited to see how this fund grows, to see the enthusiasm from Coloradans of all backgrounds as they get on their gear and get outdoors. So thanks so much for having me. Awesome. Um, thank you so much for your work. It, um, it's, it's so important that we're finally addressing um, some of these inequities that have, that have happened on conservation for, for far too long. Um, and it's great to see you, you leading the way and, and, um, and, and changing the game in Colorado. It's great. Um, I want to turn it next to, uh, to Mayor McLean for her comments, and she may have a little word about, uh, about what's the most beautiful state, but uh, I'll, I'll turn it over to her for, for her comments. Uh, thanks, Alex. I, um, yes, I have big words for the big mountains that we have here in Idaho um, that I think are the most beautiful mountains in the country um, and our beautiful foothills that I decided to highlight behind me today. Thanks so much for having me and, um, and for the partnership that we have with the LCV affiliate um, in our state and community um, on the work that we do. I wanted to highlight today the steps we've taken as a city to lead within the America the Beautiful framework, but also our climate action plan. Um, because as we've heard from um, everybody today so far, um, engaging people is important. We need to continue to ensure that it's not just um, governments or leaders um, that are doing the work, but we're actually making these people-based solutions because answers and solutions to climate, um, the reason that we need to address it um, are grounded in people. And so for our city getting involved in, Amer in the, the America the Beautiful campaign and launching and releasing a roadmap that'll get us to carbon neutrality by, by 20, 
um, 50 was incredibly important because we want to engage as many citizens in the process as possible. Boise has a long history of conservation, of community engagement, community-led conservation in particular, whether it be 50 years ago establishing um, a green belt along our river um, that to this day serves people as a commuting corridor, a recreational corridor, but also a reminder of the importance of clean water running through our city. Um, kind of began that long history that we have of community engagement. And then back 20 years ago when citizens passed, um, and I was lucky enough to be involved in the first levy that made it possible for us to set aside the foothills open spaces above our city for generations to come. And then just um, five, six years ago, we did it again, um, but this time with an emphasis on protecting any kind of open space within our community, as well as funding projects that will protect our clean water for generations to come. Um, and so I wanted to share a couple of, of examples of how we are addressing the 30 by 30 initiative, um, making it a Boise initiative, um, as now we're calling it America the Beautiful, um, which I love because it really is, it's so important to remind us of the different reasons why we do it. But we wanted to come up with a, a program that would make real these lofty national goals, also linked to our um, own climate goals and ensure that, you know, as a community, we're engaging as many of people as possible. So we've said that we are going to increase natural areas within our parks by 30% by 2030. We want to see community engagement and volunteer opportunities increase by 30% by 2030. We are um, setting aside additional open space and have committed to raising $30 million by 2030 to set aside open space and to protect clean water habitat within our community or within our watershed. Um, and so we've done, we've set aside $20 million already. We have $10 million more to go. And at the same time, we see this work in, interconnected with our climate action plan that seeks to um, you know, address car carbon se sequestration and tree planting. So we need to increase our tree canopy by 30% for, for, as part of the American Beautiful Plan that also gets us to our carbon goals. And so we launched this in um, early spring and I just wanted to share one story about how um, we tied it to important cultural and historical events um, within our community. Um, on Earth Day, we announced our commitment to the America the Beautiful campaign, um, but we did it in a way that highlights also the long history that we have here um, with the Boise Valley people, the first in inhabitants of our um, beautiful, beautiful valley. And so we launched the campaign, shared with the community um, our intent to set aside and protect open space natural areas, um, make parks more natural rather than just developed, um, to restore habitat um, and to increase volunteer opportunities by um, conduct, planting over 100 native plants um, in a preserve that's very important to the Boise Valley people um, in conjunction with, in partnership with leadership of the Shoshone Bannock and Shoshone Paiute tribes. It was truly an honor um, to go into this beautiful reserve that's sacred to um, our first people um, and plant with them to achieve the goals alongside volunteers from throughout the city. And we believe that it's in, it's in partnerships like this, in activities like this, that we can make these goals um, real for residents. And then together we're owning it and we're actually making the, um, meeting the goals that, we, that we've set aside. And then just in closing, um, I'll say that, you know, we saw in the last year and a half um, in the midst of pandemic, how important open spaces are for um, gathering safely from a health perspective, um, to taking a break when needed, to finding solace and like alone time if you need that, or to connect with people you wouldn't be otherwise able to connect with. Um, as um, the chair said, you know, there are open, there are important open spaces, beautiful places across this country. Um, we need them everywhere. And in Boise, we saw that our trail usage and park uses increased threefold. Um, in the time of the stay home order and early days of this pandemic. And the usage has continued to stay so high. So as we grow, as we face um, public health crises and needs, it becomes even more important that we take the steps possible in conjunction with our community to make sure that we preserve places for generations to come so that they too um, can find that solace 
and reconnect with themselves, with family, loved ones, and others um, when needed. And this initiative will help us do that. Awesome, Mary McLean. Um, it was really powerful to hear about the um, the partnership with the with the area tribe and reconnecting the sort of current efforts um, with the original inhabitants and, and stewards of the land. Um, I, I know that Boise Greenway from my brother having lived there, and it's such a pleasant uh, place to to go. And I can only imagine its its usage has has increased a ton um, during the pandemic. So really great resource for the for the city, and glad to see that a lot more of those sorts of places are, are coming online thanks to your leadership. Um, I'd love to turn it now to, to, to Representative Ben Diamond from Florida. Uh, thank you, Alex. Uh, and so great to be with you. I just enjoyed the discussion so much. Uh, my name is Ben Diamond. I'm privileged to represent uh, District 68 in the Florida House of Representatives, which is here in St. Petersburg and portions of Pinellas County. And uh, the issues that we're discussing today, uh, conserving and protecting our land, our water, our air, our uh, wildlife, these are some of the main issues that, main reasons that first led me to become involved in public service. And these are issues that are so, so important for Floridians. Um, we have here in Florida, you know, our natural environment, our beaches, our springs, our wetlands, our rivers. I don't have a screensaver mayor with uh, my background uh, as you do, but I'm just as proud of, of our uh, beautiful natural environment as, as you are. And I love seeing those pictures of uh, the foothills of Idaho behind you. Um, so many of us um, here in Florida have livelihoods that are dependent on these precious resources and we have to do all we can to protect them. And so uh, from a young age as a native Floridian, I valued the importance of um, the work of conservation. I learned those lessons uh, from my grandfather who uh, served in Congress from Florida, Dante Cassell, who was very involved in the conservation efforts um, for the Everglades and Biscayne Bay. And um, I just jumped right into that work. I was part of the team to pass a conservation amendment to our state constitution uh, that passed in 2014 to set aside a dedicated source of funding for land and water conservation projects. And, um, and in the Florida House, we've continued this work to um, address issues relating to our water quality and to address the impacts of climate change, since Florida is obviously on the front lines of, uh, of those challenges. Uh, we had some pretty significant successes from a conservation perspective that I just wanted to highlight, if I could, Alex, from this past legislative session. And then I thought I'd close out by talking about the challenges that we face going forward, which I think are very similar to some of the challenges that the representative um, mentioned for Colorado. Um, first, this past session, um, the legislature had moved forward with a very um, ill-advised project here in Florida to build a series of massive toll roads across the state. Um, they would have traversed some of our most sensitive land and wildlife habitat. Um, and they were not very, uh, they weren't grounded in any uh, real sense of transportation um, uh, planning. Um, they were a real boondoggle. And um, anyway, I, I led the charge to try to repeal that project, and we were largely successful in repealing that project. Uh, we were also successful in Florida in securing record funding uh, for land conservation in this year's state budget, $400 million. And of course, a large part of that success came about because in the middle of our legislative session, we received uh, the significant appropriation from the American Rescue Plan Act. So I want to thank again, President Biden and, um, and the Democrats in Congress for their leadership passing that legislation. From a conservation perspective, it was a total game changer in our state. We were able to use $300 million of that money toward protecting our Florida Wildlife Corridor, which is a specific program to protect um, uh, areas that are important for our wildlife in our state. And then we were able to appropriate another $100 million to the Florida Forever Program, 
which is the state's uh, premier uh, land conservation program. Um, land conservation has been very popular in Florida going back since to the 1960s. Floridians want to support it. Uh, they want to pay to support it. Um, unfortunately, for years before this past session, uh, the program has been uh, up and down in terms of its uh, political support. Um, but I'm trying, and many of my colleagues are trying, to uh, continue to make uh, the funding for Florida Forever a real uh, priority. And um, in terms of challenges going forward and, and Florida's participation in hitting these very important goals that uh, Chair Mallory spoke about, you know, the, the challenge we have in Florida is that we are a rapidly growing state, just like you heard from, uh, from the representative from Colorado. And we are at 21 and a half million residents and growing here. And uh, more and more people are moving to the Sunshine State. And those uh, population demands mean significant demands on our natural resources and most importantly on our water. Um, under our prior governor, Rick Scott, we had eliminated those state agencies that were responsible for our growth management laws. And so Florida Forever really remains the uh, best chance and the best tools we still have available under state law to preserve our natural uh, heritage and to preserve our um, natural lands in the face of this tremendous growth that we continue to experience here. And obviously, we just have to continue to remind people politically of all of the benefits of conservation beyond the obvious environmental and ecological considerations. Uh, here in Florida, obviously, our environment is, is incredibly intertwined with our economic success in creating and protecting jobs, in continuing to provide those recreational opportunities that the mayor spoke about were so important during this last pandemic, and in protecting our water quality, including our drinking water, which is uh, so, so important for the future of our state. So um, I know that Floridians intuitively know these issues are important, but the political challenges remain. And that's why everyone's engagement in these issues is so critical. And I so appreciate the chance to be with you all today and look forward to the discussion. Great, thanks, uh, Representative Diamond. Um, and congrats on, on your success uh, this year um, and, and hope for more in, in the future uh, for, for Florida. Um, I wanna ground us in, in something just sort of concrete. Um, tell us about your, your favorite experience in the outdoors. What, what made it so special? Um, let me go to uh, Representative Herod first. Sure. Well, um, in Colorado, we are lucky to have a historic um, African-American site called Lincoln Hills. It was one of the first sites that African-Americans could go to recreate in the country. So there's Martha's Vineyard out east, and then of course we have Lincoln Hills here. Um, and Lincoln Hills has recently been purchased back by Black ownership, and I've really focused on getting more Black youth into the outdoors. So my dad used to always take me fly fishing. So I love fly fishing. And what we've done this year and the last few years at Lincoln Hills is created a network of actually women who are um, directors or leaders in the community. And we go up and fly fish now every single year. Instead of golfing, we fly fish. Um, and then we support Lincoln Hills and all the funding that we raise through Lincoln Hills, both through um, the fishing club uh, and through donations goes to Lincoln Hills Cares to get more young folks up there. So my favorite experience um, in Colorado and in the outdoors is getting up to Lincoln Hills, um, putting on the waders, fly fishing, and then knowing I'm supporting young fly fishers who are coming up after me. That's great. Um, great. Um, Mayor McLean uh, and then Representative Diamond. Sorry, I don't mean to be like monopolizing this. Let's make this more of a dialogue for sure. No, thanks, Alex. Um, I'm smiling because for me, my favorite times in the outdoors are with my family. And from the time my kids were born or I was pregnant with them, we were backpacking in central Idaho in some incredible country that for years, and people tried to get named a wilderness area, the Boulder White Clouds Wilderness Area. And 
So there's a couple favorite stories, you know, from the time that, you know, my son was six months old and we climbed up over Ants Pass to see what was down below and wanted to get back so badly, um, to my daughter turning 16 and saying that um, for her birthday, she wanted to get out in the back country with me for five days, just the two of us. And what was so cool about that trip was it was, and we thought we were gonna go somewhere new and leave the state, but then President Obama signed the bill into law that made the Boulder White Clouds Wilderness a wilderness area in early August of her birthday month. And she decided she wanted to go back there because we'd walk into the White Clouds every year for her birthday. And we did a trailless route along um, around Castle Peak, um, which was the mountain that you know, made C. Sandras the politician that he was in a fight to protect it against mining. And for five days, we um, walked and hiked and looked for the trail, um, went over mountains, found lakes we'd never seen, um, and then woke up on her birthday at the lake that we went to for her first birthday. And unbeknownst to us, we then got the special glimpse of the wilderness rangers carrying on their backs because it was wilderness and they couldn't um, take it in any other way and um, the signage that they were putting up for the Boulder White Clouds Wilderness that morning. And it was just one of those things that we still talk about, I remember so clearly, um, but it just, it's its a place, public lands um, are, are places for us to reconnect as a family. And I, I just love them dearly and we have so many memories like that one. Well, I, I see a real theme here because I, I have the same thoughts as you, Mayor McLean, and you, Representative Barrett. I mean, my favorite places in terms of our natural environment relate to my family memories and my current family experiences. And I, too, aunt, love to fish, and they're relating to fishing. I, um, Growing up here in Florida, I, as a young boy, got to go fishing a lot with my grandfather down on this same bay in South Florida. And it was just an amazing experience to be out on the water with him as a five, six year old kid and feel like a grown up, even though I was not a grown up and to be out with his buddies on a fishing boat all day long. And uh, now our son is eight and to try to replicate those experiences and uh, to take him out fishing here on the Gulf has been an amazing experience. Um, so I, I totally agree. I think there's something really special about being outdoors that allows for those connections and makes it very special. And um, those opportunities to learn too. I mean, our son has really learned a lot about um, the uh, Gulf, the Bay. We have some challenges right now in Tampa Bay this summer with red tide. Um, and he's gotten very interested in, in all those issues. So um, it's, a, it's a special thing to be able to connect with your family uh, through those uh, types of experiences. Uh, that's awesome. That's really great to, to hear these really personal stories. Um, I, I know for my part, um, I went on an amazing spring break a few years ago with with my kids to Utah to, to actually Grand Staircase Escalante and, and recall uh, playing kind of hide and seek uh, through the narrow slot canyons with my like then, you know, four year old and six year old kid. Uh, we still look back fondly on that vacation. So anyway, got a personal interest in uh, in President Obama, uh, President uh, Biden uh, restoring protections to, to national monuments like that. Um, I want to ask, I, I know you guys are big supporters of expanding access to public lands. There are critics out there, right, who say we've got enough parks, we've got enough public lands, why do we need more of them? Like, how do you respond to that? Like, what's the value of these places to, to your communities? <laughs> Well, I think with, um, you know, with COVID, uh, we actually value it even more uh, because we realize like that it's so important that we get outside from inside of these walls and experience the great outdoors. So to the critics, I, and, and there are not as many in Colorado as maybe in some other places, we know how important it is. And because of our population growth, we also know how quickly those lands can leave us, right? And be developed in a way that um, might be fine for some areas, but doesn't actually live up to the Colorado promise and who we are as a state. And so for us, it's really important that we balance um, our conservation efforts, our need for more public land, and also making sure our public lands are up to standard, you know, especially with the increased population that's visiting them. And so we have to do everything that we can 
to keep our public lands acceptable and safe. Um, and we also have to make sure that we're doing what we can do to make to um, mitigate some of the climate changes that are happening. As you know, our state um, is has multiple wildfires going on right now and through the season. And it's important that we do everything we can as a state to protect our lands um, and ensure that we're fighting back against those fires. So, and of course, supporting those who are working in those industries to protect our lands. You know, I, I, I would actually say that Leslie and I probably share that in terms of our constituents who um, deeply, deeply value access to open spaces. And of course there's urban open spaces and then there's not, um, public lands, federal public lands. And we share um, as a community, no, I will often say, no matter how different individuals are from urban areas in the West, rural areas in the West, you know, kids in different neighborhoods, when you get out to our public lands, I mean, you share the same experience. No matter how you use them, you share that experience of being connected to nature and being connected more deeply to the people that you're sharing that experience with. And so preservation of our public lands, ensuring that they remain public for generations to come is incredibly important. And Boiseans know that um, and make that so clear to us. And then there's also um, urban parks and open spaces. And as, as we grow as one of the fastest growing cities in the country, and then we saw, as Leslie mentioned with COVID, the importance of getting outside, no matter how, um, how it was that you got outside, it's important too to reimagine what parks and open spaces look like. So can we ensure so that more communities have access to space that we're trying, we are working to set aside canal pathways and they become long um, park like places where people can walk and get outside as opposed to the traditionally thought upon like large block of land that's just a park. Or it's important that we, and we've set a goal of having access to parks, a 10 minute park so that every kid in our community can you know, walk out the front door and be able to walk to some sort of open space um, within 10 minutes of his or her home. And so that also requires us to rethink and what parks and open spaces look like. Um, but it, but it's, it's, an, it's an ensuring that everybody has that experience um, that helps you then push back against critics that are wondering why it's important. Um, because when you know it, you know it, um, and then you become a champion for it. And so engaging as many people in that is incredibly important to us. I agree with that. And I'll just add briefly, Alex, because I see that we're running short on time. I, I really love those comments from the mayor, Representative Parrott. I think that you know, part of what we have to do when we're in a political environment is build new coalitions um, to push back on those types of criticisms um, in order to make progress on conservation. And that's what we've tried to do here in Florida. You know, we have this big effort, as I think I mentioned in my opening comments, to build these massive new toll roads through the middle part of the state. And um, of course, the environmental community was concerned about it. Um, but what I tried to do was to go out and talk to uh, ranchers and farmers and uh, folks in small rural communities that were gonna be impacted and make them kind of the face of this effort to uh, turn, uh, turn back that uh, plan for massive developments of lands that should be conserved. And I think that was part of the reason why we were successful in Florida in changing opinion uh, opinions in Tallahassee because we had a really broad and diverse coalition of people uh, speaking out. That's great, you guys. Um, lots of lots of reasons to to keep supporting parks and public lands. Um, I know we are at the hour, so I want to thank all of you for for joining us for this great discussion to our panelists. Um, the, uh, the report that we're releasing today is titled Momentum to Protect America the Beautiful. So what can you all in the audience do to keep up the momentum uh, on nature conservation? I've got a couple suggestions for you. First is raise your voice in support of the goal of 30 by 30, right? You can sign LCV's petition at lcv.org slash 30 by 30. We'll keep you updated on developments in Washington and actions you can take. Um, and then second, speak up uh, in support of President Biden fulfilling his commitment to restore protections for Bears Ears and Grand Staircase Escalante and the Northeast Canyons and Seamounts Marine National Monument. You can sign our petition at lcv.org 
uh, slash monuments will get your message over to President Biden. So again, thanks so much to our panelists. Uh, really pleased to have you all here today. Thank you. Great to be with you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.